People still shock me with their lack of basic knowledge when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli subject. Some still believe that there was peace prior to October 2023, that if Hamas didn't infiltrate the Zionist state, all would be well and the major Palestinian bloodshed that followed and triggered by Hamas's actions could have been averted. Others look back at 1947, when the decision by the United Nations Special Commission for Palestine, UNSCOP, to partition Palestine into two states, a Jewish nation and an Arab nation, was formalized, and how Arabs should have taken the deal, whereby Arabs and Jews could have lived as neighbors in peace, as it was a fair and civilized deal on the table. Yet the Arabs decided to initiate a war with the newly formed non-violent Israel. In the collective memory of many Westerners, Arabs had rejected peace, thereby inaccurately suggesting that Arabs were both naturally predispositioned as anti-Semitic and as a people lent towards violence. I have news for these Westerners. The start of this whole crisis wasn't October 2023. It wasn't any of the Arab-Israeli wars of 1973, 1967, or 1956. And it most definitely wasn't 1948 when the State of Israel was established, or 1947 with the approval of the partition plan. The rejection of Zionism and consequently Israel in the 1940s was a continuation of a much longer dismissal process entrenched into the Palestinian Arabs. A rejection that was founded on a knowledge and experience with Zionism's agendas, statements, behavior, and actions. And not only in the years preceding Unskop's decision, but decades earlier. In fact, for half a century. Why don't we hear about why there was early Palestinian Arab rejection towards Zionism, meaning way before 1948? Why aren't we exposed to the progression of this anti-Zionism sentiment that was commonly established into Palestinians and Arabs over several generations? These are key questions, but no one wants to go there because what will be found would be difficult for the supporters of Zionists and Israel. Upon that clarity, one would reconfirm that over 150 years, the Zionist agendas and actions haven't really changed. Suppression, colonialism, ethnic cleansing, and other atrocious behavior was coming, and the Palestinian Arabs back then knew it. They lived it. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, there were real underlying patterns, behaviors, and experiences by Zionists that gave real evidence to the Arabs that Zionism was not to be trusted. Yes, no Westerner wants to look back that far. Not because the evidence isn't there. I think it's time to talk about why Palestinian Arabs rejected the deals that were put before them. It's time to talk about what their fears were and what they knew was to be their future fate, should the world give in to the Zionists. Within the first two decades of the 20th century, there was a shock to the Arabs in how Zionists had convinced themselves and the colonial nations, namely Great Britain and France, that Jews had a moral and just right to the land of Palestine. And with this reality, Arabs in Palestine quickly became growingly wary of how Zionism, a political movement driven by secularized European Jews, had ambitions for the establishment of a Jewish state in Arab lands, and were promoting, in Arab opinion, a weak religious argument, a biblical account, a 2,000-year-old promise by God, and justifying its inconceivable agenda. And pushing Arabs even further away from Zionism was how the Western world was bowing to the European secularized Jews' demands. For example, within a secular international world order, the laws of territorial possession were widely accepted and codified, except in the case of the establishment of a Jewish nation, where total outsiders were given a right to return to Palestine, a land where the majority of Jews had not inhabited for almost two millennia. Such a selective breaking of the law as condoned by the Western world, if applied by the Arabs, would mean that Arabs may lay claim to the Iberian Peninsula in its entirety, since they, the Arabs, had ruled the peninsula for over 700 years, centuries longer than when the Israelites ruled the land of Canaan. Palestinian Arabs also believed that the Jewish right of return should not be linked with any Jewish suffering, as in the persecution by Western nations in the preceding centuries. Persecutions, I might add, mainly committed by Christians in the form of pogroms, and never by any Arabs up to that point in time. 
Hence, such guilt-ridden European international players shouldn't use the Jewish humanitarian struggle as a platform in granting them special and superior political and national rights to Palestine. Arabs were heavily alarmed by the early Zionist position that Palestine as a nation and people never existed. Zionists began preaching a narrative that if a people had no nation or national consciousness, as in Palestine or Palestinian, consequently the lands didn't belong to them. A land without a people for a people without a land was the inaccurate credo pushed by Zionists till they believed their own fabrication. Arabs, Zionists insisted, were guests living on Jewish holy land, rather than humans with basic rights to the ownership of their lands, lands they had inhabited for over 20 centuries. Zionists had indeed spurned the Palestinian identity much earlier, repudiated that the Palestinian people had profound religious, historical, cultural, and sentimental ties to a specific area of land. Arabs, in turn, dug in. And although active within some social circles in the 19th century, the Palestinian national consciousness as a nationwide movement took off by the turn of the 20th century, and by the early 1920s, these Palestinian Arabs rejected wholeheartedly the Zionist notion that for eons, Arabs happened to accidentally trespass on Jewish lands. Zionism early on again came with another extraordinary myth, that Palestine was a land that was abandoned and unloved by the people inhabiting it the Arabs. The lands in the Zionist narrative were empty and uncultivated because the Arabs were lazy. Jews, on the other hand, as the Zionist narrative highlighted, had zeal and dedication and could turn the holy deserts into a blooming oasis. There was more to how the Zionists looked down upon and belittled the Palestinian Arabs. Zionists were quoted as labeling the Arabs primitive in their abilities and indigenous means of cultivation, whereas the Jews were far superior with their westernized education, industrial technology, and systems. And with this sharp defamation came Arab disbelief. In the numerous lies that the Zionists were peddling to the European colonial nations who would unfortunately lend a listening ear to such concoctions. Arabs were offended, and with such an offense came added rejection to Zionism. Another reckless early Zionist claim was that upon the immigration and expansion of Jewish presence in Palestine, Arabs had to be grateful for how such a Jewish shift in the population fabric would bring prosperity and more equality of opportunity to the lands, as if the Zionist colonials were gracious in modernizing uneducated and backward Arab people, and greatly improving the production of their lands. Arabs had to be thankful, and should sacrifice their want for being the kings of their own castles in return for the economic benefits brought upon by the Zionist industrials. Palestinian Arabs didn't care much for this offering. They cared more for freedom and autonomy than for any material uptick. With the introduction of more and more Zionists came the real proof that this notion of equal opportunity was a sham. Nation-building infrastructure concessions were granted solely to Jewish businessmen. Arabs were slowly pushed out of jobs and roles they and their ancestors had occupied in favor of newly arrived Jewish immigrants. This was another lie within a grand master plan that the Zionists were pushing. Arabs didn't bite, yet this condescending approach by the Zionists infused new Palestinian Arab ill will and despise towards the Zionist master plan. Promises were made to Palestinian Arabs as well as other Arabs in the region that upon their support and rebellion against the Ottoman Empire during the Great War, full independence and self-determination would be granted to them. All Arabs, let me reiterate, inclusive of all lands and peoples in Palestine. Yet the fate of Palestinian Arabs in 1917 came crashing down as they witnessed the announcement of the Balfour Declaration. A single group of Arabs were now omitted from self-determination and their fate was now in the hands of the British Empire, who had unilaterally decided to establish a new Jewish nation within their ancient Arab lands. This insult was enormous. Forget the fact that the declaration doesn't even mention the term Arabs by name, yet refers to the Jews occasion after another. Arabs were in disbelief at how the Zionists consulted Balfour in the generation of this illegal document, while the Palestinians and their majority population only came to hear of it 
when it appeared in official correspondences. Arabs were rightfully angry at such a double-crossing by the British. Nations that were supposed to protect international law were now breaking it. And with such evident hypocrisy, Arabs began to reject the British at eventually Western positions, as ones of Zionist bias and favoritism. Many suggest that Palestinian Arabs rejected two perfectly fair, generous, and reasonable plans that would have resulted in a peaceful outcome for all parties. The Peel Commission of 1937 and the UNSCOP Plan of 1947. By the 1930s, the Western nations had introduced a new reality upon the Palestinian Arabs, and that was the fact that compromise was the only way forward. The Peel Commission partition scheme provided the Jewish nation with 20% of the lands, whereas the Jews barely owned 6%. Unscop's deal was much worse, offering 55% of the lands to the Jews while only owning 7%. Hence, in the latter case, the huge majority of Arabs would have less than half of their original lands. Both deals had to be rejected. They were extremely unfair to the Arabs, heavily lopsided in favor of the Zionists. They situated a large contingent of Arabs within a Jewish nation that would ultimately expel them. And neither plan had any real clear and organized method for their implementation as we saw once the British withdrew from the lands in 1948. The Palestinian Arabs had no choice. Both the Peel Commission and the UNSCOP plans, if accepted, were going to be the foundation for conflict in of themselves. Now package all those experiences, denigrations, lies, racist ideologies, actions, and injustices together and see how you would come out on the other side. Imagine how Palestinian Arabs would feel after three generations worth of crimes committed onto them, adding and adding to their fears and hence their collective rejection. And now add onto that how the Palestinian Arabs acknowledge the Zionist position that truly never involved an amicable solution option for the coexistence of Jews and any Arabs within the Palestinian lands even back in the early 20th century. Yet even with this overwhelming sentiment of insult caused by the Zionists, the common myth today being peddled was that Palestinian Arabs' rejections came in the form of immediate, uncivil rage and violence. Again, this was untrue. Palestinian leadership at the time attempted to appeal to the civilized world and mainly the Western conscience and international law. For over decades, beginning in the late 19th century, this reaction came in the form of words versus actions. Such words were disregarded, and the rejections multiplied. To be ignorant by disassociating context and history within any argument is a way to market a preferred partial narrative as comprehensive fact. This is what the many pro-Israeli Westerners struggle with when establishing their thoughts, beliefs, and conclusions about the Palestinian-Israeli topic. Palestinians are accused of harping on their past, about how Palestinians should move on, especially now since it's been almost 80 years since Israel was put on the map. And yet, the same accusation didn't apply to the Zionists when at the United Nations in 1947, they harped on their past. A past that was much more distant and dated. A promise made two millennia ago. I believe we must continue to revisit the past, to the times when Palestinian Arabs first came into contact with Zionists, to understand their human side and reasons for rejection, why a people chose to fight for their rights over dejection and surrender. Yes, in the aggregate, the Palestinians have lost so much, their humanity, their lands, their possessions, and their rights. But we must revisit the past so that we may preserve the Palestinians' dignity and the justness of their story and cause.